essay uh, titled as uh, Ancillary Markers for Improving Reproducibility of Dysplasia Diagnosis in uh, Barrett's uh, Esophagus. On this project, Dr. Uh, Mesa was my uh, um, senior um, uh, mentor as a senior author, and uh, along with him, uh, Dr. Manuel, Dr. Eva Moto, Dr. Uh, Peltula, and uh, the gastroenterology department, uh, Dr. Brian Hansen was involved in this uh, project. So let's get started. So my objectives for the talk are to comprehend disease pathology, uh, explore uh, scope for further studies, in particular, if there are any markers that can aid us in diagnosing dysplasia and Barrett's esophagus, and uh, lastly, to corroborate the repro reproducibility of these markers as a potential aid uh, in the diagnosis. Uh, throughout my talk, we would be coming back to do the slide and expanding on this slide so that we have a sense of direction where we are heading and some repetition, uh, since I believe repetition helps in learning, at least to me. So we'll start with uh, comprehending uh, the disease uh, pathology first bef uh, before delving into the uh, research uh, project so that we uh, have a better understanding of what we are doing and why we are doing it. So uh, I will start with esophageal cancer. Uh, these uh, stats are from the most recent 2021 uh, report from Amer American Cancer Society Surveillance. surveillance. And uh, according to this report, uh, there are about 19,000 new cancer cases that are caused each year and causing about 12,500 approximately 13,000 deaths uh, uh, due to this disease. Uh, the overall five-year relative survival rate for all stages is uh, relatively low for esophageal cancer, about 20%. Uh, previously, um, uh, or worldwide, the most common type of esophageal cancer was squamous cell carcinoma. However, in Western countries, uh, particularly in uh, USA, uh, this is changing, and now the adenocarcinoma uh, is the uh, more uh, prevalent type uh, in USA. So this table is again from the same report uh, and uh, here it highlights that it causes, uh, like I previously mentioned, uh, about uh, 12,500 deaths or 4% of um, cancer-related deaths amongst uh, male, and it's the seventh leading cause of cancer-related deaths in uh, U.S. males. This table here uh, from the same report, uh, it compares the five-year survival rates for all uh, cancers, and we can see here that uh, the esophageal cancer five-year survival rate is low, and it's, uh, in fact, actually uh, second after the pancreatic cancer and fairly comparable to the liver cancer. So this means that uh, perhaps early detection uh, of this disease is important. And that's why we have all these uh, surveillance and management guidelines for this disease. So now I will uh, talk about Barrett's esophagus, uh, which is a precursor lesion for the development of esophageal adenocarcinoma. Its uh, prevalence is about 0.5 to 2%, um, and it's higher in people who have GERD uh, like symptoms with uh, about 5 to 15%. It's a metaplastic phenomena and a risk factor for the development of esophageal adenocarcinoma of the GE junction or distal esophagus. And this risk factor uh, of carcinoma increases to about 30 to 125 fold uh, compared to the general population. This disease is more prevalent in male uh, compared to female with a ratio of about three ratio one. And this uh, incidence of uh, Barrett's esophagus is further increasing. And now it's believed that approximately about 5% yearly increase is uh, seen in the um, incidence of Barrett's, Barrett's esophagus uh, due to lifestyle modification of the city and uh, dietary uh, habits. So I thought it would be interesting for us to learn a little a bit about uh, disease history as well. This disease was uh, dis uh, described first by uh, a British surgeon, uh, thoracic surgeon, Dr. Norman Barrett in 1950. However, he believed that uh, this is actually caused due to a congenital shortening of the esophagus, uh, which would pull a, a portion of the stomach upwards into the thorax, uh, and, and hence it's lined by columnar epithelium. 
However, uh, shortly after Dr. Philip and Allison and Ellen Johnston in 1953 suggested that actually that's not uh, the case and this uh, columnar uh, lined epithelium uh, structure is actually esophagus and not stomach. And they were the first ones to speculate uh, that this is probably caused by acid reflux. And uh, uh, the ulcers that were arising in this uh, columnar lined epithelium, they were the first ones to call them uh, Barrett's ulcer. Um, hence the name uh, continued. Um, and later on, Dr. Norman Barrett also um, uh, agreed with their uh, findings. Uh, and uh, besides Barrett's esophagus, he was also the, uh, among the, amongst the pioneers who described Rohev uh, phenomena and uh, one of the first surgeons who performed uh, successful surgery in those patients. Clinically, uh, it would present in, in most patients with the GERD-like symptoms such as heartburn, acid regurgitation, uh, retrust burning, burning a tight sensation radiating towards the neck. Um, however, uh, um, there are certain percentage of cases that would uh, not um, have uh, those uh, symptoms and uh, uh, the less common symptoms that have been implied are dysphagia and sensation of lump uh, in the throat. So the diagnostic uh, criteria for Barrett's esophagus, it's dependent on uh, uh, three things. One is the endoscopic findings. Uh, next one is the, uh, uh, the, the histological findings and also uh, the length and location. So basically on endoscopy, we would see these extension of tongues of salmon colored mucosa. Uh, that would be biopsied uh, and it should be uh, in the tubular esophagus extending uh, either greater than or equal to one centimeter proximal to the GE junction with a biopsy confirmation of the intestine metaplasia, which would be when we would see the replacement of the uh, squamous epithelium by this uh, uh, columnar sort of epithelium and uh, uh, presence of these goblet cells would uh, identify intestinal metaplasia. So uh, uh, briefly about the simplified pathogenesis of the disease, how it develops. Uh, due to chronic GERD, um, uh, there would be a continuous inflammation and ulceration of the squamous epithelium. And if this uh, insult keeps on continuing, then uh, the epithelium would transform into metaplastic uh, uh, in, uh, epithelium with goblet cells, which would be called intestinal metaplasia. Um, at this point, I would like to highlight that uh, other metaplastic uh, epitheliums can also develop, uh, such as columnar and pancreatic metaplasia, but those have been less associated with um, uh, progression to cancer, and this intestinal metaplasia is the most uh, well-known for a progression to cancer. So um, that's when we would call it uh, Barrett's esophagus. And if this injury uh, still keeps on continuing, the epithelium can keep on re regenerating itself or it can acquire uh, certain apparitions at a uh, uh, cellular or um, uh, uh, a nuclear level and can progress to dysplasia. And later on, this can uh, uh, progress to esophageal cancer. Um, some uh, authors also have a view that this is uh, not due to the acid reflux uh, from stomach, but actually it's due to the bile acid reflux and many studies have uh, been shown that. So dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus is actually diagnosed histologically. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, that it would bring us uh, one step closer uh, to development of esophageal adenocarcinoma. And this is usually uh, diagnosed uh, histologically based on two features, which is cytology and architectural abnormalities. Uh, in my coming slides, I would be describing these histological features, but first I would like to mention um, the um, various categories that are used for reporting dysplasia. So it could be either negative for dysplasia, indefinite for dysplasia, positive for dysplasia, which could be low grade uh, or high grade for the divided and esophageal adenocarcinoma, which can be intramucosal or invasive uh, adenocarcinoma. These are the categories that are most uh, widely used here. Uh, in uh, Europe and Asia, a modified version of this classification is used, uh, which is known as Vienna classification. And the main difference is that they use the terminology of neoplasia then, rather than dysplasia in that category. 
So negative for dysplasia, uh, as we saw previously, would be like a regular Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and if we see just Barrett's, uh, we, uh, we try to mention that there is no dys dysplasia seen in those cases. Before uh, talking about indefinite for dysplasia, I think it would be good that we uh, have a better understanding of both low-grade and high-grade dysplasia so that we can um, see what are the some features that would be lacking to make it short of calling it outright dysplasia. So we'll start with uh, low-grade dysplasia. For low-grade dysplasia, uh, um, um, the way I think about it is that it would have more of the cytological features and would be lacking um, uh, mainly the architectural complexity that would be required for uh, high-grade dysplasia. So we would see this uh, uh, epithelial transformation, which would be um, with this uh, pencilate sort of nuclei, uh, elongated nuclei with uh, um, uh, new nuclear stratification that we can uh, see here. And uh, some mitosis would be seen, uh, but overall we won't see this uh, um, like a more sort of a, a, a filling of the glands or crib reforming that we would see in high grade dysplasia. Also, um, surface, maturation, uh, surface maturation would be lost and this dysplastic epithelium is involving uh, the surface, which is a, a, a important uh, feature for diagnosing dysplasia, both in low grade and high grade dysplasia. So here's a picture showing a high power view. This is a good view because we can see sort of the normal uh, residual epithelium here and, and we can compare it to this uh, um, sort of abnormal uh, looking epithelium. We can see that it changes from the single uh, layer to more uh, stratified epithelium and we can appreciate these pencilate sort of nuclei uh, with some mitosis. Um, there is also loss of mucin that we can appreciate. Uh, and other important feature that I would like to mention is that overall, um, these nuclei still have uh, uh, an, uh, 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 their uh, polarity there. And so meaning that there is no loss of polarity and they are quite uh, uh, present at the uh, closer to the basement uh, membrane. In high-grade dysplasia, um, uh, like I mentioned previously, um, uh, it would have more cytological uh, atypia along with the complexity that we would see. So in this case, we can appreciate that uh, there are these uh, glands which are budding and there is some crib reforming um, that we can appreciate uh, in uh, these glands that would be seen. Again, surface involvement would be there for calling dysplasia and on high power, we can appreciate that compared to those pencilate nuclei, the nuclei are more rounder now. They have lost their polarity, meaning they are haphazardly arranged and do not have uh, uh, the, the polarity that we would require. There are numerous mitoses that we can see. We can see this gland budding and crib reforming, more architectural complexity um, than uh, low grade dysplasia. Yeah. So now we will talk about indefinite for dysplasia. So indefinite for dysplasia is a, a sort of a temporary category. And it's used when you see uh, that there is a little bit uh, revved up epithelium, um, but there's a lot of in background inflammation and ulceration uh, that is present. Uh, and um, more importantly, these changes are not uh, typically involving the surface uh, epithelium, that may, meaning that there would be surface uh, maturation that's still uh, preserved. So here's a picture where we can see that the epithelium looks uh, uh, crowded, but still there is mucin present and also on high power, we can appreciate that there is a lot of inflammation uh, that's uh, there. Uh, so therefore, therefore, we won't uh, outright call it dysplastic lesion. Certain other scenarios in which the indefinite for dysplasia can be used is if there is the thick sections, um, if there is denudation of the surface epithelium, if there is cautery artifact and tangential sectioning. So we have been talking about that uh, the dysplastic uh, Barrett's esophagus brings us, us one step closer to development of esophageal cancer, but uh, exactly how much is this risk of progression? And uh, literature reviews tells us that it's very wide throughout all the dysplastic uh, categories of Barrett's esophagus. And uh, um, all, all many studies have been done that shows that uh, this wide uh, range of uh, risk of progression uh, for all the dysplastic categories. For low-grade dysplasia, the risk of progression varies from uh, 0.5 to 13% to even 42% in some studies. For high-grade dysplasia, the risk of progression is 5 to 60%. And for indefinite cases, 
um, uh, for like true and definite cases, it has been said to be 0.21 to 1.4%. When I say true and definite, I mean that the studies that have uh, been reviewed by expert GI pathologists. However, um, uh, many other um, numerous studies that uh, suggest that it, uh, the risk is exactly the same as for low grade category, in particular, if we are diagnosing uh, indefinite uh, uh, dysplasia in multifocal uh, biopsies. So these findings uh, create uncertainty about true natural progression of the disease and makes us question about surveillance and management strategies and the cost effectiveness of these procedures. So we want to diagnose this disease earlier, but with this variable risk of progression, uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty, uh, uncertainty uh, stemming out of uh, that. So these are the clinical management guidelines uh, as per ACG. Uh, these guidelines are um, uh, under uh, update right now, but for now, these are the ones that uh, are the most recent and they might change in near future. Um, and they are aware of this uh, indefinite for dysplasia category. And the other thing I want to highlight is that their management uh, clearly depends on what we say on biopsy. So if we say it's a non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, they would do repeat EGT uh, in three to five years. And if we say uh, that it's confirmed low-grade or high-grade dysplasia or uh, superficial adenocarcinoma involving up to muscular mucosa or lamina propria, then they would do endoscopic eradication therapy. For the cases that we call as indefinite, they try to optimize those patients with PPI so that if there is any um, regeneration or inflammation going on, that uh, subsides, and then they repeat those biopsies. Uh, and if it still confirms that this is indefinite, then they would uh, uh, follow those patients closer uh, with, uh, with a follow-up of about uh, one year. Whereas if we on repeat biopsies say uh, that it's otherwise some other histological cat category, then they would manage those patients based on uh, the new histologic uh, diagnosis. Uh, for lesions that are more nodular, uh, looking on endoscopy, they go ahead and do endoscopic mucosal resections. And for low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia or superficial adenocarcinoma involving up to the uh, lamina propria or muscular mucosae with favorable histology, which means that it doesn't look very bad on uh, histology or higher-grade lesion, or uh, there is no lymphovascular invasion, to name a few, then in those cases, they would go ahead and for any residual uh, disease, they would do endoscopic ablative therapy. However, if it's an uh, unfavorable histology or if it's a more deeper lesion, uh, then they would do manage the patients based on a multidisciplinary uh, approach. So, um, so far, what we have learned, we can say that esophageal cancer is a disease which has a relatively uh, poor uh, prognosis with uh, extremely low five-year survival rates. Barrett's esophagus, which is a, a precursor lesion for uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma, and uh, in fact, having dysplasia in that uh, Barrett's esophagus further increases the risk of um, having uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. However, many studies we have learned now that show that this risk of progression is um, highly variable, which means that we, uh, given the disease severity, we want us to be di uh, diagnosed early and accurate as possible. However, there is some question about the true national progression of this disease. So this brings us to our second question that uh, to see if there are there is any scope for further studies and in particular to uh, for markers to aid in the diagnosis of dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. So we have already paved some way with the uh, variable risk of progression. And uh, since uh, the clinical management depends on dysplasia of the Barrett's esophagus. So let's review uh, literature and see how uh, good we are in diagnosing dysplasia. So initially, starting, I'm starting with the, the study in 1988 in human pathology, which showed that actually we are uh, quite good in diagnosing dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and in uh, this study, the concordance amongst pathologists was about 85 to 87 percent, which is pretty good. And these findings were uh, confirmed by a later study in the same journal in 2001, which showed that uh, the uh, kappa correlation was substantial amongst pathologists for diagnosing dysplasia about 0.64. Uh, 
However, later studies in the past decade have shown that this is actually not true. And many of these large multi-center cohort study, the first one in uh, gastroenterology in 2011, said that actually the um, agreement amongst pathologists, uh, in fact, GI pathologists, not very good for diagnosing dysplasia and Barrett's esophagus. This other study in modern pathology uh, highlighted, in fact, that at the extreme end of the spectrum, where we might think that we would be actually good in uh, diagnosis, such as high-grade dysplasia. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, we were diagnosed, uh, over-diagnosing those cases, about 40% uh, uh, of those cases were being over-diagnosed. And similar findings were seen uh, in a study, um, which was a, a multinational study in the uh, US and Europe and showed the same uh, discordance amongst pathologists uh, for diagnosing dysplasia. So most of these studies uh, used kappa correlation for measuring correlation amongst pathologists for dysplasia diagnosis, and that's what we used as well. So I thought it would be good for us to have a, a brief review of what it is. So basically, it's a chance co corrected agreement between two observations, which means that it would account for any agreement between observations that we are trying to measure uh, if there is any factor of uh, by chance uh, agreement between those measure, uh, measurements. And the value usually ranges from zero to one. And if it's a zero, that means no agreement. Zero to 0 0.2 is light. 0 0.21 to 0 0.4 is fair. 0 0.41 to 0 0.60 is moderate. Uh, 0 0.61 to 0 0.8 is substantial. And anything above 0 0.8 is considered nearly perfect, which is hardly seen in most cases. And based on this literature review, this was the kappa values that I overall I got. And I found that for overall, uh, all diagnostic categories, the correlation is not uh, that good. It's 0 0.4, which is a fair, uh, um, ends up in the fair category and it further decreases for negative cases and low grade cases being 0 0.22 and 0 0.11, being fair to moderate. And for high grade dysplasia, it also ranges from fair to moderate of being 0 0.4 to 0 0.4. Uh, so the reason that we have this uh, less than optimal correlation amongst pathologists for diagnosing dysplasia is that between non-dysplastic and dysplastic uh, uh, diagnosis, we have this overlapping zone. And whenever uh, there is an overlapping zone that would always be subjected to interobserver variability, it will also be affected by the disease pathogenesis, that meaning that there might be some subtleties uh, that might be more uh, seen by some pathologists and not be appreciated by the other pathologists. And also like uh, very early changes that um, uh, might not be seen histologically and would progress to dysplasia uh, later on. So that's the reason that we have this inter-observer variability and non-optimal correlation amongst pathologists for very vari variable risk of progression. And it's not something that it's um, uh, that it's, uh, people don't know. Many of the big organizations such as ACG, AGA, and even the Gastrointestinal Pathology Society are aware of these uh, facts and they uh, acknowledge these facts. And uh, the measures that they have described so far is that to use consensus diagnosis or uh, review of uh, um, dysplasia for Barrett's esophagus by expert GI pathologist, uh, two if not one. And uh, they, uh, according to the Gastrointestinal Pathology Society and based on my literature review, um, IHC markers have been tried uh, with the mixed results. These two markers are the most uh, widely that come up in the literature search. And um, based on their most recent uh, review, they say that the, their uh, expression is variable. It's not very sense, uh, standardized uh, of how to interpret those markers, in particular DP53. And these markers are not uh, widely uh, used. However, they do acknowledge that if we can come up uh, with a marker that can uh, help us identify the uh, uh, true low progressors that would be um, ideal and would be uh, beneficial for both for the patients as well as uh, uh, for uh, uh, healthcare system. So according to Gastrointestinal Pathology Society, still morphology is the gold standard and ancillary stains uh, for them needs further study to uh, be uh, used for dysplasia diagnosis. 
So we can say uh, from this literature review that uh, perhaps we are building up for a case for uh, in, uh, exploring uh, scope for further studies. Uh, and we have found that there is suboptimal correlation amongst pathologists for diagnosing dysplasia and Barrett's esophagus and IHC markers, which have been tried or have mixed results are uh, not standardized and are not uh, widely used. So we can say that there is scope for further studies. And this brought us to our question that perhaps we can try to find uh, some markers uh, which would help us in uh, diagnosis of dysplasia in Barrett's esophagus. So this brings us to our study uh, that has been published. And I, like I mentioned, Dr. Mesa was my uh, mentor as a senior author on this project. And uh, uh, Dr. Manivel, uh, Dr. Iwamoto, Dr. Peltula was involved uh, from our pathology department along with Dr. Hansen and his team from the gastroenterology department. So um, it has been implied previously uh, uh, that markers such as cell, uh, that are involved in cell cycle, cell to cell interaction and differentiation and senescence uh, 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 happen in the earlier events in Barrett's esophagus. So we hypothesized that perhaps uh, these markers would help us uh, 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 by producing different patterns of staining in these two categories, regeneration and dysplasia, um, uh, uh, help us to increase the reproducibility of dysplasia diagnosis in Barrett's esophagus. The markers that we uh, selected for our study are these, beta-catenin, SATV2, CD44, OCT4, cyclin D1, K67, P16 and gamma H2AX. Uh, out of these, the uh, first four beta catenin set P2, CD44, and OCT4 were uh, cell regulatory markers. Uh, cycling D1, uh, KI67, and P16 were uh, cell cycle markers, and gamma H2AX is the marker associated with cell senescence. So before uh, talking about our study methods and design, it's uh, good to have a, a brief sort of review of these markers. Uh, and uh, so that we have a better understanding why we selected these markers. So beta catenin nuclear uh, expression implies activation of WNT signaling pathway, which can cause uh, a transcription of many uh, downward genes and has been implied and overexpressed in many tumors. SADP2 is a special ATDH sequencing binding protein too, which regulates transcription and chromatin remodeling in colonic cells. Cyclin D1 initiates mitotic S phase uh, by phosphorylating the retinoblastoma protein, which leads to DNA replication and overexpression is common in many tumors. KI67 is a proliferation marker, is a non-histone nuclear protein, which is expressed in G1, S, uh, G2, and M phases of cell cycle, but not in G0 and early G1 phase. P16 is a tumor suppressor protein, which prevents progression into the S phase of the cell cycle. Its increase in expression is seen in aging and senescent uh, cells and overexpressed in many tumors with inactivating RPG. Gamma HUX is overexpressed when there are double strand breaks and it halts the mitotic cycle normally to allow for DNA repair. And it has been reported to be overexpressed in pre-malignant and malignant uh, tissues. CD44 is a cell adhesion molecule that plays an important role in tumor progression and metastasis and contribute to the maintenance of the uh, stemness of malignant cells. It is considered a cancer stem cell marker in several types of cancers. And lastly, OCT4 is an embryonic stem cell regulating gene and has been reported to be prognostic in esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. And some studies have implied it in esophageal um, adenocarcinoma and also has been implied in uh, lung tumors. So this brings us to uh, our uh, initial study method. So basically what we did was that after selecting our markers, we uh, take the EMR and found 20 cases uh, for uh, either esophageal gastrectomy cases or endoscopic mucosal resection cases. And from these cases, we uh, basically curated uh, 10 micrographs for each diagnostic category, full thickness sections, and uh, we selected the blocks for uh, matched IHC uh, for uh, the categories so in total 40 cases uh, were um, a mic or micrograph albums uh, micrographs were uh, obtained for all these diagnostic categories and uh, therefore we curated a micrograph album of our study case, study cases 
Um, so in our study, uh, in this initial study and uh, in the next study, the uh, morphology was the gold, gold standard and consensus diagnosis was the gold standard, uh, meaning that all three pathologists uh, 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 did a consensus conference and uh, redivided these cases and cases were re-diagnosed into metaplasia, non-Barrett's, Barrett's metaplasia, low-grade dysphasia, high-grade dysphasia, and then indefinite for dysphasia. For IHC interpretation, initially we did, we did a semi-quantitative uh, analysis. And in that analysis, uh, we did percentage of the positive nuclei and intensity. So for percentage, uh, the uh, score ranged from zero to three, zero being negative, one was one to 5%, two was six to 50%, and three was greater than 50%. And intensity was uh, weak, moderate, and and strong and based on these two uh, scores, the scoring ranged from uh, anywhere from uh, zero to six uh, with the combined score. And uh, we asked three uh, pathologists uh, to uh, perform a morphologic diagnosis individually and uh, do an interpretation of the, the all the eight selected markers in three compartments, um, such as the, the surface compartment, neck, and the base of the glands, along with the percentage of the nuclei that are staining in intensity. So here is an example of uh, out of those 40 cases where we can see the uh, uh, HNE slide and then the uh, simultaneous uh, IHC slide for all the eight markers. And for these eight markers, uh, like I said uh, previously, we did the percentage and intensity and we measured for the surface compartment, neck compartment and the base of the glands. So see, these are the initial results for our initial um, study. Um, as I mentioned, uh, after the diagnosis uh, being made by the pathologist individually, uh, they sat down and did, did the consensus conference and then uh, did a consensus diagnosis. And based on the, uh, the, that consensus diagnosis, cases were reclassified uh, as such, like uh, 16 cases were reclassified out of those 40 into negative uh, for dysplasia, 14 were in low grade dysplasia, nine were in high grade dysplasia, and one was in uh, indefinite category. And these uh, diagnoses were also dichotomized for non-dysplastic, which accounted about 40% of the cases in dysplastic, which included indefinite low-grade and high-grade dysplasia cases and about 60% of the cases. So here are the markers out of those eight markers that were statistically significant on our uh, this initial study between dysplastic and non-dysplastic uh, Barrett's esophagus. So gamma H2X was the only marker that so showed a significant difference for um, all three um, uh, gland compartments that is surface, neck, and base. Uh, KI67 and CD44 showed differential expression in surface and neck. Um, and then cycling D1 showed it for surface only. The marker that showed most statistically significant was surface KI67 um, and then neck and base uh, uh, gamma H2AX. However, out of all these markers, um, surface KI67 was the one which showed the least, least uh, p-value uh, and uh, greatest mean and more difference for uh, staining. So here is a, a, a picture which looks a little busy, but please bear with me and I will try to explain it. Uh, I included it in this talk because it gives us a nice comparison for staining uh, of various markers uh, in relation to each other, as well as uh, for this non-dysplastic and dysplastic uh, epithelium. So column one and three would represent non-dysplastic and uh, column two and four in, represent dysplastic epithelium. Uh, and then uh, these two, column one and three represents one marker and two and four represent the second marker. So we can see that for KI67, um, uh, there is a clearly a differential sort of expression between non-dysplastic and dysplastic epithelium. It, it is more basally located in the crypts and it's more surface uh, staining for uh, dysplastic epithelium. Same goes for cycling D1. We can see the differential expression with surface involvement, a gamma HUX, even though it looks uh, that it's staining very less cells, but whatever, but whatever is staining, it's staining in the surface epithelium. CD44 shows uh, as a clear trend too. Um, uh, again, uh, more of the surface staining with, in the dysplastic epithelium. However, we can appreciate that there is background uh, of, of the hematolymphoid elements that are staining with this, with this marker, which makes it a little bit harder to interpret. 
The markers that did not uh, show any statistical significance uh, were four other markers, which were P16, beta catenin, OCT4, and uh, lastly, SATP2. SATP2 did not show a staining at all in any of the uh, of these uh, regions. Um, and then uh, P16 and OCT4 were the other ones that showed very minimal staining. And beta catenin showed intense uh, staining in all 40 cases and throughout the staining with no uh, statistically significant difference. So here's another uh, table, which again looks a little busy for operating characteristics, such as sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value uh, for all the statistically significant markers that I described previously at various cutoff levels of expression. So basic jinx of this table is that uh, at a cutoff of less than 5%, um, many of these markers uh, showed greater sensitivity, however, specificity, positive predictive value were low and negative predictive value a value was uh, moderate. When we increase the cutoff greater than 5%, sensitivity decreased a little bit, but specificity and positive predictive value uh, improved substantially. And in most of the cases, neg negative predictive value uh, increased, um, include, uh, excluding few. And at cutoff of 50% did not do much uh, uh, better. It just decreased sensitivity with the same specificity, positive or negative predictive value. And out of, of all these markers, the, I would like to highlight surface KS67, which showed the uh, most favorable results um, with a sensitivity of 100 at a cutoff of five, uh, less than or equal to 5%. And at greater than 5%, it decreased a little bit uh, of 87.5, but specificity and positive predictive value improved quite much to 87.5 and 91.3% uh, respectively, and negative predictive value decreased a little bit from 100 to 82.4. Since cutoff of uh, greater than 5% was the one that was the most favorable um, in our, uh, so for our further studies, that's the one that we use. So this brings us to our next steps for uh, this study that what we were trying to achieve was to improve uh, correlation for dysplasia diagnosis. So, uh, and based on these results, we can see that uh, the best discriminative power for separating dysplastic from non-dysplastic lesion was KI67. So we selected this marker and then we made a new micrograph album with H and E and its uh, concurrent matching KI67. And we requested the pathologist to review these cases um, uh, with the surface KI67 as a diagnostic aid and come up with a diagnosis. And then we did a kappa co uh, correlation between individual pathologists and consensus diagnosis uh, with and without the use of ancillary test. So here are the results of um, this uh, uh, kappa correlation amongst pathologists when comparing morphology alone with morphology and KS67. And we can see that uh, there was overall improvement. Uh, we have a reference value here at the uh, bottom. And we can see that uh, when comparing uh, uh, pathologist one and pathologist two, three with consensus diagnosis, uh, the kappa value improved from 0 0.40 to 0 0.80 and 0 0.69 to 0 0.75. Uh, for pathologist two, it decreased a little bit. Uh, for pathologist one comparison with pathologist two, it improved from 0 0.50 to 0 0.70. And for pathologist uh, one and pathologist three, it improved from 0 0.40 to 0 0.95. And for, lastly, for pathologist two and pathologist three, it improved from 0 0.62 to 0 0.75. And also it improved overall, which improved from 0 0.55, which was moderate, to 0 0.77, which was substantial, uh, as we can see from our uh, reference intervals here. Um, here is a, a, a picture uh, of uh, the dysplastic lesions from our um, uh, the initial uh, study on EMR specimens. We can see this picture A represent low-grade dysplasia, and the picture B is the uh, KI67 concurrent for the same specimen. And these arrows over here rep represent non-dysplastic epithelium. And arrowheads, we can see, uh, appreciate now that these are the dysplastic lesions. And again, we can clearly see the differential expression in the same uh, um, uh, picture where uh, the uh, uh, non-dysplastic area lacks surface expression and dysplastic area has more of the surface expression. Same goes for this picture C, which is high-grade dysplasia. And again, we can appreciate the uh, differential expression for dysplastic here and non-dysplastic here. 
So uh, we now we can uh, say that after establishing the uh, disease severity and also uh, making a case for um, uh, it potential room for improvement, in particular for improving the uh, correlation amongst pathologists for diagnosing dyspasia and Barrett's esophagus. And in the quest of these markers, we found significant differential expression of cell cycle, cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and cell senescence markers in dysplastic and non-dysplastic Barrett's epithelium, particularly in the surface compartment. And surface KI67 has the best discriminative power in our study differentiating dysplastic from non-dysplastic um, epithelium. This brings us to our last question that are these results reproducible on a much larger scale? Um, and since KI67 was the marker that uh, showed on our initial results the uh, most favorable results, so we uh, followed this study with a case control study using this marker. So for our case control study, we used uh, 170 glass slides and four groups were selected based on uh, uh, histologic consensus diagnosis and clinical outcomes. And in group one, we had uh, cases with, which were diagnosed as negative for dysplasia. These included 50 biopsies from 41 patients uh, and histologically classified as negative. And they did not progress uh, on after a period of 181 months. The second group included indefinite cases of 51 biopsies from 41 patients. Uh, 26 of these based on progression did not progress after a, a mean follow-up of 181 months and 26 progressed after a mean follow-up of 46 months. Next come the low-grade dysplasia, which included 49 biopsies from 35 patients, which are classified as low-grade dysplasia, and they progressed to high-grade or esophageal adenocarcinoma after a mean follow-up of 51 months. And lastly, uh, the group included high-grade dysplasia, which had 20 biopsies from 17 patients and classified as high-grade and progressed to esophageal adenocarcinoma after a mean follow-up of eight months. So in total, uh, 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 for this indefinite group, uh, we, uh, the ones that did not progress we, uh, by combining, we combined those with negative cases. And the ones that progressed combined with the uh, uh, dysplastic cases, which brings us to our true negative cases of 76 biopsies and true positive cases of 94 biopsies. So after selecting these uh, slides, we randomized these slides and uh, I requested the pathologist, three pathologists to uh, review these slides. Uh, first initial only H and E slides and come up with a diagnosis. Then after a washout of uh, 20 days, we requested again the pathologist to review these slides with uh, H&E and KI67 combined. And based on these results uh, or data, we came, uh, calculated kappa correlation with and without uh, KI67 between pathologists and with the consensus diagnosis. We also did odds ratio and correlations uh, for bivariate relationships between KI67 and progression and KI67 and diagnosis. And also uh, we uh, did operating characteristics such as sensitivity, specificity, negative predictive value and positive predictive value for two categories, uh, progression if it was present or not, um, two categories if KI67 was positive or negative and two category evaluation with and without KI67 for dysplastic versus non-dysplastic epithelium. So now comes the results of our uh, this case control study. So again, we have this uh, um, reference uh, table here for uh, measuring the kappa intervals. And we, uh, we saw the same similar trends as we saw in our initial study of improved kappa correlation amongst pathologists for dysplasia diagnosis. For all diagnostic categories, uh, it improved from FAIR by histology alone, which was a kappa value of 0 0.29 or 50% agreement amongst pathologists. Uh, to uh, moderate a uh, kappa value of 0 0.60 with histology and KS67 combined and 72% agreement. Uh, when comparing it to dysplastic versus non-dysplastic, again, we saw a similar trend uh, with improvement of kappa correlation from moderate, kappa value of 0 0.41 to 71, uh, with 71% agreement and uh, to substantial kappa value of 0 0.63 uh, and 82% agreement. And uh, for the agreement for interpretation of KS67 was uh, substantial amongst pathologists with a kappa value of 0 0.64. 
So when comparing the use of KI-67 uh, to uh, progression, uh, we found more cases being um, uh, uh, correctly uh, reclassified based on progression with the use of KI-67, 76% versus uh, 69%. Pearson correlation coefficient was moderate for both categories, uh, 0.42 and 0.56. However, uh, another interesting finding was that we found the increased odds risk ratio of progression, 15.3, in uh, cases which showed uh, surface KI-67 expression. So here are some pictures from our case control studies. A picture A represent uh, non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. And we can clearly see in the concurrent uh, picture VKI-67 that there is no surface expression. This picture C uh, has some uh, fluvial hyperplasia that we can appreciate. And show in picture D, we can see that there is surface KI-67 expression. And that would uh, make us think about a, a possible dysplasia and outcome was progression in this case. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why it's not moving now. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know, there is some uh, technical glitch here. Okay, so now it's moving. Sorry, so sorry about that. Uh, so picture E again uh, represents uh, um, a, a Barrett's esophagus with a little bit of surface atypia. And uh, in the concurrent uh, IHC, we can see KI-67 that has surface expression. Um, again, uh, based on this, we would think about a possible dysplasia and outcome was progression in this case. Picture G is, uh, shows an other utility of this marker where we can see some denudation of the epithelium and uh, uh, whatever was left in the residual epithelium, we saw increased surface K67 expression and uh, the outcome was progression in this case as well. So now I would uh, uh, break down the results based on the four groups the, of this uh, case control study that I initially described. For group one, which is true negative cases, uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity improved, uh, combining the K67 with histology from 71% to 94% and specificity improved from 77% to 94%. For group three and four, uh, which were true positive, sensitivity and specificity uh, both showed uh, uh, some improvement from 75 to 76% and 80 to 81%. And uh, the cases in this groups were reclassified. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, reclassify classification of those cases. 52% um, were uh, uh, reclassified into negative category, 32% in low grade category, 14% in high grade category, and 2% in indefinite category. Um, and the, when comparing this reclassification, um, so our two measures were consensus and uh, progression. So based on consensus diagnosis, uh, more case, uh, comparing to consensus diagnosis, I'm sorry, more cases were correctly reclassified using K67 with histology, 90% compared to 84%. And based on progression, again, a uh, similar trend was seen with more cases being correctly reclassified, 76% versus 67%. However, uh, with the, this new reclassification, we saw that in the negative category, about 30% of the cases progressed. In indefinite category uh, that were reclassified, uh, in which we had 2% of the cases, 50% uh, progressed and 50% did not. And for dysplastic category, uh, we saw that 76% of the cases progressed. So here is the overall statistical analysis for uh, this validation case control study. Uh, we can see, uh, like previously mentioned, that kappa correlation improved from 0 0.60 to, uh, uh, from fair to 0 0.29 to 0 0.60 with combining uh, KI-67. Uh, Sensitivity also improved from 0 0.64 to 0 0.88. Specificity decreased a little bit from 0 0.77 to 0 0.67. Positive predictive value remained uh, the same and negative predictive value increased from 0 0.72 to 0 0.88. So what are some key findings that we can extract from uh, this data? 
So in, uh, we found that the surface compartment showed the largest and statistically significant difference in marker expression, which was highly significant for two markers, Ki67 gamma H2x with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, and also showed statistically significant difference of expression for CD44 and uh, cyclin D1. These uh, findings sort of provides uh, uh, an ancillary support for the histological criteria for uh, uh, presence of the dysplasia at the surface uh, to call it a two uh, dysplasia. Secondly, um, the expression of TI67 cyclin D1, which are sort of a my cell cycle, uh, cycle markers, were differential in the two processes, uh, which is regeneration and dysplasia. Next expression was there in both of the compartments, but regenerating uh, epithelium has more of the base of the gland staining and this uh, dysplastic had more of the surface uh, staining, which sort of highlights the um, similar findings uh, that we see in a clonic adenomatous uh, progression. And gamma H2X was the only marker amongst all the markers that showed significant differences in all the compartments of the gland. However, a consistent differential overexpression was present only on the surface. Uh, and also uh, for overexpression of proteins involved in cancer progression, such as CD44 and gamma H2X is, uh, was in keeping with the non-genetic instability of uh, dysplastic barrett's esophagus that has been implied previously. So key points for when, when comparing correlation and progression. So in our initial study, we saw that a use of the ancillary K67 improved the correlation of individual pathologies from moderate to substantial, comparing it with the consensus diagnosis, which, go, which makes us think that it improved the performance of individual pathologies, which is comparable to the consensus diagnosis. Uh, and uh, we followed this uh, trend with our, uh, for validation for a case control study on patients who, which have known outcomes. And in this study, we found, confirmed our improved kappa correlation amongst pathologists using uh, ancillary KI67 from fair to moderate, uh, confirmed a better uh, correlation with outcome using KI67 from 69% to 76%, and confirmed increased odds uh, ratio of for progression in cases that have expression of surface KS 67. And overall, we saw improvement in sensitivity from 64% to 88% and negative predictive value from 72% to 88%. Same positive predictive value and lower specificity, 67% uh, versus 77% and comparing it with the histology alone. As for indefinite cases, uh, these cases, when comparing them to consensus diagnosis, were correctly uh, reclassified about 90% of the cases. However, however, um, we found that 31% of the cases that were reclassified as non-dysplastic showed progression, and 24% of the cases that were reclassified as dysplastic did not progress. So these findings indicate that surface KI67 is not uh, perfect, you have to take it with a pinch of salt and the clinical pathologic judgment is uh, still uh, the key and perhaps there is still a quest for a better marker uh, than this one. So for uh, surface K67 expression, our study suggests that if there is any abnormal ex uh, surface, uh, uh, exp any surface expression should be considered abnormal. And it is also since it's associated with increased odds uh, ratio for progression, if there is any surface K67 expression in uh, some patients. Uh, however, if the uh, surface K67 is negative, since it has a high negative predictive value uh, and that combined with the histolo right histology, uh, meaning that the uh, proliferative compartment is confined to the neck or basis of the glands, it confers a low probability that dysplasia is present. So the conclusions, the main conclusions that we can draw from our talk are that uh, significant differential expression of cell cycle, cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and senescence markers were seen in our study in dysplastic and non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, particularly in the surface compartment uh, of the mucosa. Um, surface KI67 was the marker that showed best discriminative power amongst all the markers tested for uh, differentiating dysplasia from non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Uh, surface K67 expression in Barrett's epithelium is likely abnormal and it, as it is associated with high uh, odds of progression. 
um, and uh, it has uh, surface K67 had an impact on uh, reclassifying indefinite cases uh, with a high negative predictive value. However, um, uh, about a third or quarter of these cases that were that were originally diagnosed as indefinite uh, uh, were uh, misdiagnosed, uh, indicating it cannot replace clinical pathologic judgment. And uh, still, there is a quest for a better ancillary aid. Uh, and use of ancillary surface K67 improved lastly the co kappa correlation between the pathologist and improved correlation uh, with the outcomes. So back to our initial slide, um, in case you found this talk or our project really long, uh, I would like you to take these uh, key take home points with you um, that in, the, in our initial study, we found that there was significant differential expression of cell cycle, cell to cell interaction and senescence markers in dysplastic and non-dysplastic thick parrot uh, esophagus, particularly in the surface compartment. And in the quest for uh, looking for reproducibility of uh, this marker, we found that surface K67 had the best discriminative power with high odds risk of progression uh, for disease if this marker uh, is staining. And surface K67 also improved the kappa correlation between pathologists and improved correlation uh, with the outcome. So these were my references for the talk. Um, and lastly, uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Mesa, Dr. Manuel, and Dr. Iwamoto uh, for making me part of this project and pathology department at VA, and uh, also for helping me achieve my career goals. Uh, and for that, I would also like to talk, uh, thank Dr. Khalifa, Dr. De, uh, Dr. Stewart, Dr. Amin, and Dr. Dolan, uh, and, uh, and also entire surgical pathology and clinical pathology department uh, here at uh, University of Minnesota for um, uh, being such a supportive uh, team throughout my residency and fellowship training. And last but not the least, I would like to thank our my wonderful colleagues for being so supportive and an awesome team. Um, this would conclude my talk. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and I'm sending some sunshine and uh, warmth your way. Thank you everyone. Thank you, very good job. Once again, attendance code is 1308. Do we have any questions for Hira? Nice presentation, Hira. This is Dr. Day. Quick question for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Gamma H2AX? Uh, what exactly is it? I thought I heard you say it's a uh, sending sense marker. Yes. And uh, so how do you explain if that's true, you will express it as expected to be down regulated in the context of proliferative uh, lesion. So yeah. I can explain it, uh, showing so much. Especially. Yes. So this marker has been implied uh, in many cancers, like I previously mentioned, and uh, this is overexpressed. It has been implied that it has been overexpressed in esophageal cancer in particular that are uh, in, uh, um, seen in uh, um, radiation associated esophageal uh, carcinoma. And uh, it, it has, uh, it somehow it is supposed to uh, be like uh, uh, doing its job, but uh, in pre-malignant and malignant uh, cancers, uh, it, it stages it shows uh, increased expression uh, due to the deranged uh, pathways, and perhaps it's trying to overcome all the aberrations that are happening there, but uh, it's uh, coming short or something. That's why we have this increased expression that has been shown for this marker. Thank you. Dr. Nelson. I was just going to say, Dali, I, I was thinking similar things. It's really cool. I mean, because gamma H2X is it's phospho H2AX. It's it's a marker of accumulation of DNA damage. When DNA damage isn't cleared properly, when there's abnormalities of DNA repair that accumulates, and like you said, Dali, you know, Dali and I are both part of this um, human senescence big U54 project uh, with Paul and Laura, and and gamma H2X is one of the markers that we use. As a as a senescence marker here, I, like I really enjoyed your talk because a lot of the markers that you and the team chose were very biologically driven. So it's it's actually was fun to see how some of them played out from a diagnostic perspective. But I do find it interesting, you know, as we do more with just 
natural senescence or, or senescence in normal tissues versus the the same things that we can kind of see in cancer and and the the run up to cancer, which is dysplasia. It's that balance between cells shutting down due to increasing DNA damage versus them basically changing the microenvironment. Um, with Jim McCarthy and Kaylee, we, we study CD44 and also RAM and yeah, the concepts yeah. of how they're on it. And so it's, it's just really interesting to see those, how those markers go up in that interplay between things that are potentially driving proliferation in the face of DNA damage versus, you know, driving brakes, you know, putting the brakes on cell cycle and, and P16 not being significant kind of plays that role that there's a balance where there's DNA damage in this setting, at, mm-hmm. but something when there is true dysplasia is tipping it more towards proliferation and microenvironmental regulation and modification rather than, you know, truly putting on the brakes for, for stopping the cell cycle. So I yeah. thought that was just really cool. And, and Delhi's question kind of made me think about how that's kind of nicely all come together with your study here. So it's yes. great to hear. Thank you. Excellent work here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to end for the day. The attendance code 1308-1308. We will see you at nine for quality.